Welcome to Slate Church. We are so glad that you're tuning in today and pray that wherever you are, this message will bless you. If this impacts you in any way, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. So good. Why don't you grab a seat? Make yourself at home. Here we go. Awesome. Can we give it up for the worship team? That was powerful. Holy smokes. That was so good. So great. Well, I hope you have come expectant into this place today because I am excited to preach what God has laid on my heart uh, in this new year, happy new year, 2020, a new year, a new decade. I mean, it's like the most epic thing, I, uh, you know, uh, everywhere on social media. New decade, new year, new. It's a little wild, but, uh, but it is. It's a new decade. It's a new year, 2020. We're going into the roaring 20s once again. Was anyone in here alive during the last 20s? <laughs> You'd be very old. Yep, someone in the back. Yep. You weren't alive. No, no, it's not true. It's not true. Listen, we are so excited as a church for what God is going to bring in this year. We're excited as we go forward. At the end of this month, we have our Vision Sunday, which is going to be amazing. You're going to be hearing more about that. But listen, we have a lot in store. So buckle up because it is going to be an incredible ride as a church for what God has for us. But we also believe that God has so much for you individually. And God has so much for your family. And so much... Look at this. Did someone drink that water? Was that water contaminated? <laughs> was that water poison? I don't know what's going. It was going to fall. Okay. <laughs> this water looks like it's been it's been drank <laughs> a little bit. Oh, that, you know what? If it fell, it wouldn't be the first time. I tend to like baptize the front row just with the water bottle each time. So, but it's going to be a fantastic year. Listen, we're going to jump right into the, to today at into Judges chapter 6. Judges is a book near the beginning of the Bible. Uh, it's, it's close to the start. It's in the Old Testament. And if you're not familiar with scripture, this is kind of new to you or whatever this looks like. It, it's in the part of the Bible that looks forward to Jesus coming. Jesus comes in the New Testament is when we see him come, is born. That's why we celebrate Christmas. He does some great, incredible ministry here on earth. He dies and he rises again. And then the remainder of the New Testament Testament is seeing that outworked in the local church, seeing what it looks like to live out the gospel, the good news of Jesus in our lives even today. But we're in the Old Testament and we get to see how God is working this plan of redemption where, where humanity fell away, chose something other than God, and he's starting to work out this plan of redemption through his chosen people, the Israelites. And listen, the Israelites are kind of people who go a little back and forth here, okay? And honestly, I I can see my own humanity in the Israelites every time I am reading about them in the Old Testament. I'm like, man, they just, they give up on God pretty quickly. They turn away, they forget things all the time. And honestly, I can see that in myself. And I love reading the stories about them. And we're going to do that tonight as well. In Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says this, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. The Midianites were enemies. They were opposition to the Israelites. Verse 2, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts and caves and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. This was serious oppression. These were serious times that they were living in. Skipping down to verse 11, it says this, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, Abiz right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. 
Verse 13, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has given us to the hand of Midian. We're going to jump into the New Testament. You don't have to follow me there. I'll just read it quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. Paul writes this to Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God, the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Why don't we pray this evening, Slate Church? God, I thank you that we get to be here in this new year, Lord, and that we get to worship you. We get to hear from your word. And I just pray that you would speak so clearly through me tonight and that we would just have our hearts open to everything that you want to say and teach us. In your name, amen. 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 Well, I hope that you had a nice Christmas season. I hope that that was good to you. Listen, if it wasn't, you made it, all right? You're here, uh, you, you, you went through it, and you've now come to the other side of it. So here you are, good for you. But I hope that it was great. Um, I know a lot of people had a lot of time maybe with family and friends and food, uh, and those really all go together at the same time. I know we did. We, we spent a lot of time with family over the break. We went up to on uh, the Christmas night I guess not Christmas Eve, it was the eve of Christmas Day, I don't know. It was Christmas night, and we drove a couple of hours to uh, my in-law's house, and we kind of camped out there for the week. We got comfortable, we unpacked, we spent the week there relaxing with our kids and with family, and it was really a fantastic time. And, you know, if you're a parent in this place, you know it is great when there are extra hands in the house. Like when there are extra family members present, it is a good thing, okay? Because then you are not the only one who can take your child to the potty. You're not the only one who can get them dressed in the morning. You're not the only one who can do all of these things. So I found myself like sitting in a chair for more than five minutes at one time. I was like, this is amazing that I'm actually sitting down. I opened a book. It was all really good things. All parents know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you're not there yet, get some good friends in your life that can, you know, hold your kids and love them and and give you a break sometime, right? So we were doing that. We were having a great time. And then one night, Brandon said, you know, I I think I'm going to go for a walk. And if you were in the morning services this morning, Brandon told a story. He went on several walks, okay, while we were at his parents' place. I'm like, what walk was that? Was I not with you on the way? He's like, no, I went for another walk on another day. Uh, But if you missed that, it doesn't matter. This this night, this evening, it was around 6.30 p.m., and he's like, I think I'm going to go for a walk. And I'm like, I'm going to go for a walk with you. We can leave the kids here with uh, your parents, and I'll just come with you. I'm like, we can go on a date. This is like a date walk all in one that we can go and do right now because other people are in the house. It's a good thing to have other people in the house. And so we went outside, and you have to know that Brandon's parents live in the middle of nowhere. There is like nothing around. Literally, I was looking at this screen this morning. At your, I'm like, this is where they live. This is what it looks like all around. There's just forests all around their house. And it is beautiful to go there in the winter time. So we went out and I'm like, okay, this is great. This is going to be great. But how many of us know that at 6.30 p.m. on a Canadian winter night, it is pitch black outside, okay? We're talking no street lights, like no light anywhere. But thankfully, Brandon, for Christmas, he received a little headlamp. So <laughs> it was very nice on you. Um, so he puts his little headlamp on, and, and, uh, and we, we go outside, and, and I'm like, oh, this is so nice. And then we start walking away from the house, and we go onto the road. There's no sidewalks. They live in the middle of the country. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, it's, it's dark out here, hey? <laughs> like, it's looking pretty pretty dark out here. Do you think anyone can see us, like, if they drive towards us? And I'm, like, dro- jumping into the ditch as people come by because I'm afraid. And, and we're walking along, and I'm like, did you, did you happen to bring your cell phone? It's like, no. Did, did you? No? Okay. All right. Could you just turn that light off for one second? He turns it off. We can't see anything, okay? It is a cloudy night. It is dark. It is pitch black. Like, we couldn't even see our hands in front of our face. And I'm like, okay, let's pray that that light does not turn out. Because I don't know what we are going to do if it does. And we're walking along the road. Brand's like, okay, here's where we turn. 
And so we turned down a path, uh, another roadway, and it's a little bit less uh, plowed, and there's more snow everywhere, and there's, it's a little bit thinner. And I see a sign that says, like, no winter maintenance. And I'm like, where are you taking me? What is happening here? We're going deeper into the woods, and we're talking, and I'm getting a little bit nervous. I'm like, babe, are you scared? Because <laughs> I'm kind of scared. There's, like, wolves in, this, uh, in these woods. There, there must be bears. I swear I saw a moose that was ready to attack me as we were driving to your parents' house. Like, I was getting a little bit nervous. And then we walk, like, forever down this path. And he's like, all right, this is where we turn. And I look, and I swear to you, he just has his little headlight that goes into the path. I'm like, you are taking me into this, like, crazy, dark forest where there is barely a trail now. Like, I don't know where you're taking. It's a good thing I trust you because I would swear that you were coming out here to kill me. Like, it was absolutely insane. It was so dark. And then out of nowhere, I'm very scared at this point. Brandon's like carrying on conversation. I'm really scared, like adrenaline pumping. Out of nowhere, Brandon does something so uncharacteristic of himself. He never does this. All of a sudden, obviously, I don't know, the walking maybe brought some extra saliva into his mouth. I don't know what happened. But all of a sudden, he spits. He spits into the forest. And I jump like a bullet was just brought out of a gun, headed straight for, like, I jumped out of my skin. I was so terrified. It was pitch black. It was awful. By the time we got home, I was, like, dripping with sweat. I just, like, felt like I ran a marathon because I was so scared I was going to die in the forest that night. Well, fast forward to the next afternoon. Brandon's like, oh, I think I'm going to go for a walk again. He's doing this thing where he likes to go outside, which I think is a good thing. And I'm like, oh, I'll go, I'll, <laughs> you know, maybe we should all do that more. I was like, oh, I'll come, I'll come with you. And we walked the same path as we did the night before, but it was in the broad daylight. And I'm like, this is the most beautiful place I have ever seen. Look at the snow, just so nice on the trees. And we're taking pictures. I'm like, this is amazing. This is the best. And when we got back to the house, I was like, it's incredible the difference that light makes in any given situation. It's incre I went from being so fearful to so amazed at the creation of God and what it looked. I was like praising God the whole way. It was the best walk of my life, I think. I was like, this is amazing. But just a little bit of light in the same circumstance, in the same situation, changed everything. You see, when we look at the Israelites here in Judges, we see a dark season. We see a dark forest. This was no joke. This wasn't a situation where they had some bad neighbors who didn't mow their lawn often enough. That was not the situation here. They were completely oppressed. They were hiding out in caves. They were hiding out in small little alcoves because they knew that the Midianites were over, over top of them. They had, they had no power over them. They would plant crops, they would try to get food, and it would be trampled down. Nothing was left alive. Nothing was what they could eat. They were hiding out, and they were afraid, and it was a dark, dark season. The Israelites time and time again would turn away from God and walk into this darkness and go, who turned out the lights? Why is it so dark when God actually just allowed them to follow through and see the consequences of the choices they were making? They were in the midst of this darkness when all of a sudden we see Gideon enter the story and enter the picture here. Where did God find Gideon in the midst of all of this? He found him hiding in a wine press. Okay, he was in a wine press getting wheat so that he would have some food. Gideon was afraid. He was hiding out. He was terrified when God found him. And I love how the angel greets him. He says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Gideon did not look like a mighty hero in that moment as he is hiding away, trying to get some bread together for himself. He did not look like a hero. He was terrified of his enemies and that they were going to find him and take away his resources. And his response to the angel was one of fear and doubt. And oftentimes I find these two things go together. When you find yourself afraid, we often can find ourselves doubting what God is actually doing and what God is saying to us. His response is, why has God done this? 
Later on, the angel says, you're going to rescue Israel. And he goes, what are you talking about? I am going to rescue Israel. Out of all of the Israelites, the clan that I belong to, they are the lowest. And out of my entire family, I am the weakest. Like bottom of the barrel, that's me. I am the least likely person. Why in the world would God use me? And sometimes I wonder if we can feel this way. God, what are you talking about you want to use me? You know, week after week, pastors get up on this stage and say, God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. God has called you. God wants to use me. And maybe you sit here and you hear that and you go, what are you talking about? I am the least of the least. I don't know enough. I'm not equipped enough. I don't have enough friends. I don't have enough skill. I don't have enough talent. I'm awkward when I talk to people. I can barely hold a conversation with people I know and love. What do you mean I'm supposed to lead something? What do you mean I'm supposed to join a team? What, what would this actually look like? I don't know what you're talking about, God. How could you possibly use me? But even in the midst of Gideon asking for signs, he goes on this ramp with God, asking for signs that God is who he says he is and all of these things. And then he follows God, God's lead but does it with fear and trembling. God does incredible things through Gideon. You know, as we go into this new year, many of us have a lot of dreams for the future. Or at least expectations. Maybe you're not a New Year's resolutions person. Maybe you don't like goals. Maybe all of those things are not for you. But you probably still have some expectations about what this year is going to look like. Maybe you've gone into this year feeling like this year is going to be my best year yet. This is the year I'm actually going to become a morning person. Maybe I'm actually going to go to the gym. I'll eat better. I'll go after that new job. I'll be kinder to my kids. I'll go to church more regularly. Maybe you'll get involved. Maybe you have all of these things. But listen, for many of us, in, unless we actually take that trust from ourselves and just trusting our own plan and our own ability and turn it over to God, we're probably going to find ourselves in the same place next year. If we're just being honest here, habits are hard to break. Things that we've been doing for many, many years are hard to change. And you might be successful for a little bit with your own strength. But unless we actually turn it over to God and trust him, we're probably going to find ourselves back in the wine press getting some wheat together, afraid of the world out there. We're probably going to find ourselves walking through a dark forest just with a tiny little light going, I'm not sure if I should keep going forward. I'm not sure what this actually looks like. And we're not going to be able to enjoy all that God has for us as we walk through this life. If you're taking notes tonight, you can title this message, Only God. Only God. You see, in order for Gideon to actually step into the calling that God had on his life, he had to trust God. He had to trust him. And this same goes for us today. Trust is not necessarily an easy thing. Maybe there have been people in your life who have broken your trust. Maybe you feel like you can't trust anyone. Maybe you trust too freely and you get hurt time and time again. But God asks us to trust him. And this is a discipline that we actually need to carry into this new year. If you have any goal this year, it ought to be to trust God more. Because it is only when we trust him, it is only when we take it off of our own shoulders and say, I'm going to look to you, God, that we can see the miraculous actually take place. That we can actually see God working in our lives. So I want to dive into this a little bit more tonight. And the first way I would say we need to trust God is that we need to trust God in our training. Trust God in our training. You know, many of us maybe have had jobs in this place, and we've had some form of training. If you can think back to maybe some jobs, part-time jobs that you had uh, maybe earlier on in life, you probably went through a similar training process for every single job you had. Maybe you found yourself in a room, like in the back of a grocery store, this was my experience, where you're like filling out forms and signing things, and you don't even know what you're signing. You're like, yeah, this sounds good. I'll pay for my uniform. I don't know. I don't know what's actually going on here. And then all of a sudden, they give you a booklet, and they like slide across the table and put in like a VHS. I don't know. This was a while ago for me, but I'm guessing that Zare still has the VHS player in the back room of the grocery store. And they put in there and it's like women's training. And it goes through all of these different things. I'm like, great, now I can read a bleach bottle. That's all it's really going to do for me. And there's like this training process. And with any job, there is this training process. With anything we do, we have this training process because training is necessary if we're actually going to complete the task that we 
are set up to do. We have to have this training period. You see, God gives Gideon a training assignment. He gives him this first assignment, and this is to destroy the symbol that the Israelites have built that they've turned away from God to worship. He needs to destroy it. This is, this is heavy stuff, okay? It says this, that same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood from the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. And basically what we see happen is the townspeople wake up and they basically freak out. I mean, all of a sudden, this altar that they had built that they are using to worship Baal has now been destroyed, and they figure out that it's Gideon, and they're like, we need to kill him. Like, that is their first, we, he needs to die. And we see Gideon's father come out, and he goes, wait, 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 like, let's, maybe don't kill him. Um, if, if, if he needs to die, we'll let Baal do it. Like, we'll let, we worship this God, so obviously he can handle this for himself. It's his altar that got turned, teared down, so he can, he can handle it. And obviously, because Baal was literally just that altar, just that, like, he's not actually a God, Gideon lived. He actually <laughs> continued to live. This shouldn't be such a surprise. But this might have really seemed like a big deal to Gideon. This, this tearing down the altar that all of his family, all of the Israelites were worshiping, This was a big deal to him. This was risky. This was something that he could have died over. And it might have seemed like the biggest assignment that he ever could have been given, when in reality, this was actually just experiential training for him. Gideon was just in training. You know, in this life, you are going to find yourself in seasons of training. And training might challenge you because it's meant to. It's meant to push you, but it isn't meant to finish you. You may have had some difficult things that you walked through in 2019, some challenging things. Maybe you need to view this 21 days of prayer and fasting as training ground for what is to come in this new year. This fasting idea, it's a time to actually just step away from food, certain foods, not not fully. Don't not eat for 21 days unless that's something you really want to try to to go into. But you might want to prepare for that a little bit more. But cut back something. Maybe you fast breakfast. Maybe you're fasting sugar. Maybe it's late night snacking. Whatever that looks like. What does it look like to set aside this fast and turn to God in the midst of it and say, this is training ground for me that I'm going to dedicate this time to look. This is sacrifice for me so that I'm actually turning to you. Training ground. You see, instead of seeing things in your life as God abandoning us, we need to start viewing this as God preparing us. God is preparing us and training us. The only way you get stronger is by intentionally lifting weight. And the only way you get ready for what God has for you is by feeling the weight of the training ground that's in front of you. You know, Proverbs 24, 27 says this. It says, prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. Basically, prepare everything and then build your house. It would be foolish just to build your house without being ready for it. Matthew 4, Jesus himself is baptized. And then he goes out into the wilderness where he, he abstains from food. He fasts. And he is tempted by the enemy. He is put into difficult places. He is weak in his own flesh. And he is put into places where the enemy is coming up against him three different times. And Jesus comes back. And this is training ground. Jesus comes out of that situation and begins the ministry that would completely revolutionize and change humanity. That was training ground for him in the desert for what was to come. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You see, the training ground is not something to be despaired. It is something to be treasured and trusted. We need to trust God in the training that he has set up for us. This is a perspective shift. You might face some big things in your life, and you might be like, this is it. 
I've put it all out on the line. I have risked everything for this. I have found myself in a place that I didn't expect to find myself. I'm tearing down an altar and everyone is going to hate me. I am doing things that are risky, that are big, that are difficult, that are challenging. But I want to suggest to you tonight that perhaps that is simply training ground. Don't underestimate what God wants to do in your life by shortcutting the process, by saying, okay, that training ground's too much. Okay, that training ground is just, that, that's way too difficult. That's way too much for me to handle. That is way too much. God is having more for you. Perhaps that challenging thing you went through is training ground for the thing that you're going to see in this next year or this decade ahead. See, if we're able to trust God in our training, it's likely going to expose our fear. You know, so often we are afraid of new because we don't want to face discomfort or awkwardness or worst of all, perhaps failure. We have this fear that someone else is going to get ahead of us, fear that we are not enough, fear that if we risk something that we might fall on our face, maybe fear that we will fall on our face again. Maybe we've had that experience before, but when we trust God in the training, we're going to see the areas of fear in our lives. And so we need to trust God in our fear. Gideon was not just in training. He was not just called. He was also seriously afraid. We see this from the moment that we are introduced to him in scripture. He was in a wine press hiding away. Don't miss this point. He was afraid of the Midianites, and it might seem that he had every right to be afraid. But God says, why do you need to fear? You see, fear often robs us of our focus, but fear does not mean that God cannot use you. You see, God's not asking you to have it all worked out before he will call you, develop you, and use you. There's this amazing process called sanctification. You see, there's this other thing called justification, and that's the process of when we come to God and we acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, and we become justified. Jesus stood in the gap that sin created in our lives with God. There was a gap created when sin came into this world, and Jesus, by dying and rising again, created a relationship that we can freely have with God if we turn to him and choose him. We are justified. By faith, just simply having faith in him. But then there's this amazing process after we make that decision called sanctification, where this is growing in holiness. This is growing more like Christ. But this isn't just about us mustering up all that we can do. It's not just saying, okay, I'm just going to muster this up. I'm just going to get church on my calendar. I'm just going to, and then I'm going to become more like Christ. No, this is actually allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and transform us, to do the work for us, to open ourselves up to what he has for us. You see, God has a plan for you, but this isn't to set you up for failure in the midst of being afraid. It's to reveal his power through it. Gideon was afraid. If you feel afraid in this place, you are not alone. You are in good company. Gideon was afraid of the Midianites and was hiding in the wine press. He was afraid of the townspeople while on his first training assignment and decided to do it at night rather than in the day. He was afraid that God wasn't able to come through. So he puts God to the test multiple times, even though in Deuteronomy it says, do not test the Lord your God. And he said, well, I'm so afraid I still need to test you. I need to see if this is actually going to work out. He was afraid when God asks him and tells him after this training ground that he's actually going to go and attack the Midianite army. He was afraid. But do you know how God responds to fear? Probably not the way you would expect him to. He responds with patience and love. See, God saw beyond the fear that Gideon had. He saw Gideon for who he created him to be, and that was a mighty warrior. He saw him in the midst of his fear, but he still called him something different, a mighty warrior. And all along, God plays along with Gideon's testing. He's like, okay, I see that you, you obviously need this confidence. I'm just going to go along with this. I'm just going to humor you a little bit. I'm just going to, I'll go along with this. And each time he says, okay, do you trust me now? Yeah, I can, I can, get, I can get that thing. I can make it dry. Do you trust me now? Yeah, okay, I can do the reverse. Everything's dry. Do you trust me now? Okay, Gideon, how much longer can we do? Like, do you trust me now? I've got you. It's okay. Do you trust me? 
you're not even supposed to be testing me like this. But I still love you, and I'll still be patient with you because I see that you're afraid. But despite your fear, I still have plans for you. Fear doesn't disqualify us in this place from what God has for us. As God is sending Gideon to attack the Midianites, he says, listen, I know that you're afraid going into this situation. So why don't you just go and eavesdrop on a conversation with the Midianites, and I'm just going to show you that I've got you. It says this, it says, God says, if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Purah and listen to what they are saying. After your, afterward, I think you'll be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Purah the servant went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Think about that for a moment. There are thousands upon thousands of people there, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. That's a lot of camels, if we just picture that for one moment. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And then his friend responded. I love that. Like, the dream is obscure. This is me telling Brandon my dreams, okay? I'm like, there was a room, and then that room disappeared, and then there was this thing over here. And I'm like, this is, it made sense in my head. It doesn't make sense now that I'm saying it out loud. This is a weird dream. And his friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. God is giving a lot to Gideon. Because he is a gracious, good father. God has not called you to leave you. God has not called you to fail you. God has not called you unaware of the fear that you have. He knows Gideon was afraid. It was, it's not a surprise to him. It's not a shock that Gideon is a little bit worried and a little bit fearful about what is going on. It's not a surprise. And if you're in this place and you're going, I don't know if I'm enough. I'm the lowest of the low. I'm a little bit worried here. I'm a little bit afraid of stepping out and having that risk and giving generously and being part of this church or, or inviting somebody out or actually reaching out, actually being kind. To I'm a little bit afraid of what you've called me to, God. God is saying, I'm going to be patient with you in that process. I'm going to love you. I'm going to give you all the confidence that you need. I'm going to be right with you because I don't see you as a fearful person sitting in a wine press. I see you as a mighty warrior. And because I've called you that, I'm going to stick with you through the process. He is a good father. And I think that for some of us, we really need to know that in this place. That God has not failed you. He's not vindictive. He's not sitting up in heaven going, oh, yep, knew you were going to fail there. Yep, knew you were going to be afraid there. We need to trust God in the midst of our fear, and he is going to carry us. How much more clear could he be? God does not look at your fear and see failure. He looks at your fear and sees opportunity for faithfulness. He's a good father. He will equip you and qualify you for he has called you. So we need to trust God through our training ground. We need to trust God in the midst of our fear, and we need to trust God in our weakness. You might be going into this new year feeling totally empowered, fully equipped, or on the flip side, you might be feeling completely incapable of whatever this 2020 looks like, whatever you feel like God is pushing you towards, directing you in. You see, Gideon knew when he was called to fight the Midianites, that, that there were thousands of them. He knew that this was a big deal. And he, in, in, his, in himself, did not feel equipped. So he gathered together a vast army himself, 32,000 men. That's a lot of people to gather together and lead. That is not a small feat in and of itself. He prepared himself. He was ready for a serious fight. You know, maybe God has called you to something and you feel like you need to prepare yourself to get your act together, to pull together your army, so to speak. But I think what happens next is so wild and it fits perfectly into God's upside down kingdom where he's saying, hey, I do things a little bit differently than what society might do. I do things a little bit differently. And listen, if you can trust me in, the, in your weakness, I can do incredible things through you. I love this. Chapter 7, verse 2, God basic, basically says to Gideon, you know, I know you've gathered these 32,000 men, but listen, there's too many people here. 
you're, you've just got too many people fighting. So he tells him to send home anyone that's afraid. He says, I'm just going to give them all an out that if you're feeling a little bit afraid, go home. You can go home. No big deal. Just turn around. So Gideon gives this announcement. Uh, if, you're, if you're afraid, why don't you head on home? And 22,000 men are like, see ya. Like, I am getting out of here. I'm going back home. I'm going to hide in my cave. Like, that's where I belong. 22,000 leave. And he's left with 10,000. I'm sure at this point Gideon is looking around going, okay, that was a significant shift. Like 10,000, 32,000 swarm of locusts, the Midianites over there. How the heck are we going to do this? What are you talking about, God? I am now at a deficit. Can we, well, at least these guys are brave. At least these guys are ready to fight. At least these guys feel good about what they're doing. So this should be okay. And then in verse 4, God comes and says, listen, there are still too many. But instead of just giving a, a personal choice based on how people are feeling, I'm going to get you to tell everybody to go take a drink from that stream over there. Like this is kind of a wild way to do things. All 10,000 men head over to the stream to have a drink. And God says, okay, just take a look. Just watch how they drink their water, okay? And then I'm going to tell you what to do next. And, and basically, the men who picked up the water with their hands and, and, and slurped it out of their hands, he's like, okay, those men, those guys can stay. Everybody else sent home. Anyone that got down their hands and knees and just drank it with their mouth, send them home. And I'm sure Gideon's head counting, and he's like, oh, gosh, I need to count again because I'm not sure if I got this quite right. And he counts, and 300 men, just 300 men picked it up with their hands. 9,700 men got down like animals. And he's like, did your mothers teach you nothing? Like, I needed you in this moment. He's like, okay, go home. And I'm sure that Gideon looked around at a crowd not much bigger than what is in this room right now. And went, God, how? How are we going to do this? Like, we are going to be sent in there to die. We are going to get destroyed. This is not going to work. We are now weak. We had 32,000. Then we had 10,000 of some brave guys. And now we're down to 300. Their camels could take us out at this point. Like, what in the world are you talking about, God? I equipped myself with 32,000. And now I am left with 300 just because of how they drank water. How's this going to happen? There's no way we can do this. But if we look back in verse 2, God tells him why right from the beginning. He says, if I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves in their own strength. Oftentimes when we are trusting God, you better believe there's going to be a stripping away process that takes place. We can equip ourselves. We can prepare ourselves. But listen, we are stronger with 300 than we are with 32,000 if God is in it. In our own strength, we can boast in that. You see, some of us are allowing our weakness to be our setback. When in reality, our weakness is our set up to watch God do a miracle. For too long, people have said, I am too weak in this area. I have failed in this area. I have fear in this area. And therefore, I need to be on the sidelines. I'm going to be on the sidelines of life. I'm going to be on the sidelines of church. I just want to stick with the status quo. I just want to stick to the things that, that I know are going on. I just want to stick to the easy, comfortable life. If I don't stand out to anybody, if I don't put myself in a place where anyone could talk about me, if I don't actually just get myself out there, I'll be safe. And I'll be good and I'll be protected. And we want to protect ourselves. We want to pad our army so that we feel good going into it. When in reality, our weakness, our inability, where our ability comes to an end is where God can do a miracle. Where God can actually work. God isn't allowing us to feel weak as a cop out for not going forward. If you're weak in this place, great. God can use you. Don't let that be your cop out for saying, I'm not going to push forward in church this year. I'm not going to help people. I'm not going to serve on a team. 21 days of prayer and fast, that's not really for me. Don't let your weakness be a cop out for what God can do. That's not how he sees it. He is allowing us to feel weak so that we can fully depend on him. He isn't asking you to step into what he is calling you to do next in your own strength. Listen, if you can easily do it on your own, I wonder if it is from God. 
Do you have room in your goals for this year for God to move? Are they maybe a bit too small? Have you taken it up with the one who calls you? Maybe the one who actually has more in store for you. Listen, church, we need to trust, trust, trust in our training, in our fear, in our weakness. And then we need to watch God work. You see, at this point, Gideon split the 300 men into three groups, and he gave them each a ram's horn and a clay jar. This is not your typical fighting gear. You would be expecting to be handed a sword, and he's like, here's a clay jar. Like, this is what you're going to go and fight the army with. I'm sure that these 300 men were like, what is going on? And then they went down to the camp, and they snuck around. In verse 20, it says, the three companies, the three groups of Israelites blew their trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the, Midi- all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, The Lord caused the men throughout the camp, the Midianites, to turn on each other and start to kill each other. They start to take each other down with their own swords. Only God. Only God. Not only were they stripped down to 300 men, but they didn't even have to fight. They simply had to blow a horn and the Midianites turned on themselves and took each other out. They didn't even have to fight. Only God. I want to live a life where I can look at the miraculous things that are happening around me and say, only God. There is no way that this could have happened in my strength. There is no way. I had to trust God to see this through. Only God. The men didn't even draw their swords. They took down this army. This army is thick as locusts by simply blowing their trumpets. It's a wild story. I wonder if you have any only God moments in your life. You know, for me, I look at this church and I go, only God. How in the world, in less than three years, did a launch team of 80 people turn into hundreds of people coming every single Sunday, turn into almost a thousand salvations in this church? turn into five services across three locations, turn into family and friends coming in and meeting Jesus for the first time, turn into people who are far from God, not wanting to give church a chance, coming here, turn into you being in this seat right now. How in the world? Only God. Only God. But you know what? God is not finished yet. God is not finished yet. Perhaps we've seen a lot as a church over the past two and a half years. We've gone through a lot of things. We've seen incredible things take place. We've seen God do amazing things. We've seen incredible battles take place in individual lives. In people's lives. We've seen babies born that doctors said would not be born. I believe one of them is at the back being held right now. We have seen marriages restored. We have seen healing take place. We have seen prophetic words given from this stage that have completely changed people's lives. We have seen incredible things. I wonder if you have those only God moments where you've seen family come and meet Jesus. Where you, maybe that you're in this place is an only God moment today. But church, as I was preparing for this message, I really felt God put on my heart that what we have seen and the battles that we have faced and the things that we have overcome It's actually just training ground. That we are in the midst of training ground as a church. We are actually just on our first assignment. We are actually in a place where we might feel like the risk is high, where we might feel afraid, where God is saying, I need you to trust me in it. But this is just training ground. Because the battles that are coming and the things that God is asking us to go into and the places that he wants us to reach and the people that he wants to see come into this church it's a swarm of locusts. There are, there's, there's more than, than sand on the seashore. And this is not a battle where we need to take everybody out. and all their, We're not battling against people. We're battling for people. 
We're battling for people to be able to come into here. And listen, those people in your life that you're saying, this is going to be so difficult. This, this person would never step foot in a church. I believe that we're not even going to have to battle. We're just going to blow a horn. And all of a sudden, they're going to turn to us and say, I want to come. How can I get involved? How can I be a part of it? But you know what it takes, church? It takes us trusting God in the midst of this training, in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our weakness, all of those things that really we can't do in our own strength. We need to now turn and trust God. Stop focusing on ourselves. Stop focusing on one another. Start focusing on what God can do and stepping into what he has for us. Perhaps in your own life, the battles that you face, the victories you've seen are training ground for what's next. Maybe God wants to surprise you in more ways this year than you could possibly imagine. Maybe in your marriage, your workplace, your family, your team here at church, at Slate Church. But it will take trust. Trust that God is training you. Trust that God is greater than your fear. And trust that in our weakness, he is strong. 2 Timothy 1, 6-7 says this. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is in this place. For the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, church. Power. Gives us love. The people that you feel are unlovable, you can love them. Because the Spirit of God gives us love. And it gives us self-discipline. Can we stand in this place? Thank you for watching. Again, if you were impacted by this message in any way, send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. You can also visit slatechurch.com and fill out one of our online connect cards. We would love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. As well, you can stay connected with us by following us at Slate Church on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.